Oh dear. Oh, I bet you can now. <laughs> Just making sure everyone's awake. I want to uh, welcome you to morning worship here at Wolfwood Baptist Church. Uh, if you don't know me and you're visiting, my name is Scott Kinder Barnes. I'm the senior minister. And uh, Ruth's going to speak and introduce herself in a few minutes. Um, a couple short announcements. Uh, the June uh, church business meeting takes place uh, this Wednesday uh, at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And so please uh, try to make that. Uh, also, I want to speak to the rose in the pulpit. And congratulations to Darren and Ann Booth on the birth of their granddaughter, uh, Sailor Jade Booth. She was born on uh, June 14th uh, to Daniel Booth and Eden Dykins of White Rock. So pray for that family and congratulations, but also pray that the young parents are, who are not going to be getting any sleep for the next little bit. <laughs> A after, after the service today, we are going to go ahead with the church barbecue, which actually starts at 12, not 2 o'clock. It starts at 12, and we're going to try to get it in before the rain. Uh, a few of us have been offering prayers, but it doesn't always work that way. So. Um, we're also still looking for delegates to send to the Baptist Assembly, known as Oasis, in early August in Moncton. And so if you are interested, we can have up to five delegates. And if you're interested, please speak to myself, uh, Michael Jeffrey, uh, Evelyn de Schiffer, or contact the church office, or, or speak with Ruth as well, and we will direct you in the right way. <laughs> this thing here, up front, is called an antipendia, and recently the white with gold has gone missing. We're not sure what happened to it. So a number of us have been looking for it, and if you know where it is, <laughs> please come and talk to us because we want to we wanna find that. Um, I, I, this thing here, I'll show you. That, uh, that was missing for a couple of weeks. It's called a modesty rail, and we can't be a church without having a modesty rail. So <laughs> Actually, we do use it for other services on occasion. So we have found that, but there is one more thing that we're searching for. And it's this, and this is to go under, there are two of them, and one of them has gone missing. So if you know where it is, it actually goes under our, our dish rack out in the kitchen. So please, please, if, if you've borrowed it or if you know where it is, we would ask that you uh, return it. Ruth? I'm quite sure there is nothing I can say that is going to top a missing dish towel. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, actually, you know what, in, refer in reference to that, we are so grateful for everybody who helps around the church, helps with the dishes, helps move things, um, helps put things away, um, and quite a few of you do that. So, really, we're very grateful, but of course, in the doing of that, Sometimes we have people who don't know exactly where things go and things just get put away and then we can't find them. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's what that's all about. My name is Ruth Ton. I'm one of the pastors here. Welcome this morning. So glad that you're here. I'm very excited about this morning. The um, Edge youth and Edge kids have the service. So I'm so looking forward to what they are going to bring to us. But before they do that, I would like to introduce to you our summer students who are here for, the, for, for here until middle of August. Um, so I'd like to invite Caitlin Lightfoot and Brady Cox to come on up here. And I'd also in, like to invite whatever deacons are in the building. Yep, right over here. John? Oh, good, it's on. Um, oh, good, I'm good. Thank you for coming up. So this is Caitlin, and this is Brady. They started two weeks ago. They've been busily planning our summer program uh, for kids ages primary to grade five, and they are also planning the VBS, 
BBC for the uh, 12th to the 16th of uh, August. And uh, so far, they've been doing a great job. Uh, there are endless lists of things that need to be done and have to be gotten and uh, things that they, ideas that they're having, uh, trips to various places, uh, things that they can do, sports that we're going to participate in, places that uh, maybe even a nursing home to go sing at, you think? All right. Yeah, they've got a lot of things on the go, so we're very excited to have them. This is Caitlin's second year with us. So welcome back. They are both Acadia students, and uh, yeah, cream of the crop, cream of the crop. Only the best for the people in this church. That's what I have to say. Um, we, we'd I invite the deacons to lay hands on them as we pray for them for the summer, and I invite you to stand and pray with us as well. Father, you love children. You, you smile at their antics. You love to hear them laugh. Jesus, you blessed them and played with them when you were here. Thank you for these students that you've provided for us. Thank you for their ideas, their creativity. Thank you that um, they're willing to just give their life this summer among all the things that they could have done. They're here with us to look after our children, to teach them about you, and Father, just to give them a good, safe time over the next couple of months. I pray that your blessing will be on them. I pray that they will have safety. I pray that they will have creativity. I pray that they will have a good time themselves as they minister to your children. Father, I pray that... Uh, Your favor will be on our camps and on our VC, VBC, and Father, that uh, many children, many children, will hear of you this summer and come to know your love and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me.
I invite you to pray. God of love, we thank you for who you are, for your faithfulness, goodness, grace, mercy, and much more. Throughout our lives, you are always there and always listen to our prayers. We invite you into this space, into wor our worship, and into our lives. We ask that you will speak to us today in this worship service and lead us in the days to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Young, old, and everyone in between. Come, let us worship and bow down. Amen. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to 2 and 16 through 19. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers. They shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They're extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the formal things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Here ends the first reading. Second Corinthians chapter three, verses four to 18. We are sure about all this. Christ makes us sure in the very presence of God. We don't have the right to claim that we have done anything on our own. God gives us what it takes to do all we do. He makes us worthy to be the servants of his new agreement that comes from the Holy Spirit and not from a written law. After all, the law brings death, but the Spirit brings life. The law of Moses brought only the promise of death, even though it was carved on stones and given in a wonderful way. Still, the law made Moses' face shine so brightly, the people of Israel could not look at it, even though it was a fading glory. So won't the agreement the Spirit brings to us be even more powerful? If something that brings the death sentence is so glorious, won't something that makes us acceptable to God be even more glorious? In fact, the new agreement is so wonderful that the law is no longer glorious at all. The law was given with a glory that faded away, but the glory of the new agreement is much greater because it will never fade away. This wonderful hope makes us feel like speaking freely. We are not like Moses. His face was shining, but he covered it to keep the people of Israel from seeing the brightness fade away. The people were stubborn, and something still keeps them from seeing the truth when the law is read. Only Christ can take away the covering that keeps them from seeing. When the law of Moses is read, they have their minds covered over with a covering that is removed only for those who turn to the Lord. The Lord and the Spirit are one and the same, and the Spirit and the Lord's Spirit sets us free. So our faces are not covered. They show the bright glory of the Lord, 
as the Lord's Spirit makes us more and more like our glorious Lord. Here ends the second reading. All right, so at this time, it says adults moment. So we need a couple adults. Come on up front. You can sit here, and kids who usually come up front, you can join us and just come sit on the front here. So if you're a person my height or close to it, yeah, you sit here on the floor. Sorry, work on those knees. Come join us, adults. And kids who want to come up front, you can come sit on the stage here. Or, or I guess sit with moms and dads if you want. So we got a couple of uh, kids and youth who are going to help and share our story with us today. Do you want to sit here? Sit? I'm just going to pass this over to Kathy. I'm going to pass it over to Shifra. Okay, so I have a question for you. Has anyone read this story? Okay, well, we're going to read it to you guys but not the original. We're gonna read it in our way. And it's called, uh, it's called The Very Hungry Maggot. In the light of the moon, a little egg lay in a compost bin. One Sunday morning, uh, one, one Sunday morning, the warm sun came up and pop, out came the egg, came a tiny and very hungry maggot. It started to look, it, he started looking around for some food. On Monday, he ate one moldy piece of cheese, but he was still hungry. On Tuesday, he ate two rotten fish, but he was still hungry. 
On Wednesday, he ate three smelly onions, but he was still hungry. On Thursday, he ate four bowls of dog food, but he was still hungry. On Friday, he ate five overripe bananas, but he was still hungry. On Saturday, he ate one dead carcass. One rotten tomato. One cup of sewage. One caterpillar. One puddle of milk. One piece of decaying wood. One onion. One goldfish. One sausage. And one cup of glue. That's nice. He had a stomach. stomach. The next day was Sunday again. The maggot ate through one nice expired steak, and after that, he felt much better. Now he wasn't hungry anymore, and he wasn't a little maggot anymore. He was a big, fat maggot. He built a small house called a paparium around himself. He stayed inside for more than four days. Then he punched a hole in the pulperium, pushed his way out, and... He was a slightly irritating fly. <laughs> okay, awesome. So uh, today our theme is all about transformations in the book of Acts. And uh, one of the most beloved transformations uh, that you might have learned about as a kid um, is the story of the very hungry caterpillar. And, and of course, this start, book starts out with a cute, fuzzy little caterpillar who's very hungry. Um, who, and uh, the caterpillar eventually turns into a gorgeous butterfly uh, that's, uh, with dazzling beauty. Now, um, our story, The Very Hungry Maggot, um, is a little less appealing. It, uh, it's about a, a maggot, and maggots are, well, gross, and the flies they turn into are irritating. Um, but flies are actually unsung heroes in the natural world. As you can see here, there's, lots of, there's uh, tons of different examples where flies are actually beneficial. Uh, they are great pollinators. They're part, an important part of the food chain. They also help uh, uh, make uh, decomposing organic matter disappear. And um, some flies are even downright gorgeous. Uh, if you look at that fly, that's a common blue bottle. And just look at it. It's very iridescent blue. Um, yeah, so flies do a lot of the behind-the-scenes work. And uh, that's not unlike some of our friends from Axe, like Paul and the Disciples. Um, yeah, their stories of transformation didn't, always, or didn't uh, give them glorious lives filled with power, privilege, uh, wealth or power, um, and um, they poured a lot of their time and energy into uh, building up the church, and, uh, but in doing so, uh, they faced uh, ridicule, rejection, hatred, and abuse, right? But they, they were incredibly important in constructing the foundation for the early Christian church around the world. So the next time that you look at a fly and pick up that fly swatter, maybe you want to reconsider and... Uh, and think of all of the uh, things that flies do in our natural world. Let's pray. Okay. Dear God, uh, thank you for flies. And help us to remember that like these humble insects, everyone has a purpose for each of our lives. And although it won't always be gorgeous or widely appreciated, uh, help us know that it is important to you uh, and beautiful in your eyes. Amen.
The book of Acts was a letter written by Luke to his friend Theophilus, describing the adventurous and action-packed stories of the growth of the early church, from its humble beginnings in Jerusalem to um, the spread of the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. Over the past few months, the children and youth have been learning these stories, and they've summarized them in a video. The youth wrote and read the narration, and the children and youth acted it. So we hope you enjoy our production of Adventures from Acts. Long ago in Jerusalem, people from everywhere were gathered for the Jewish festival of harvest. There were people from Parthia, Media, Persia, Elam, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Greece, Asia, Pamphylia, Cyrene, parts of Libya, and all of the other places. They had snacks and decorations and tambourines. It was quite a party. A bunch of followers of Jesus, aka the disciples, were sitting together in a room and all of a sudden there was a loud whooshing sound. 
Tongues of fire appeared over their heads, and when they tried to speak, they were all speaking in different languages they had never spoken before. Some were speaking Greek, others spoke Latin, a few spoke Aramaic, some Persian, and some Arabic. The people at the party outside heard them speaking about God, and they were all like, Whoa, what's going on? That's my native language. Some of the people thought that the disciples were drunk and laughed and made fun of them. <laughs> Peter stood up and said, those people aren't drunk. He promised that he would send the Holy Spirit to everyone who believes in Jesus and his love, and that they would do amazing things. God sent his son Jesus to earth, and you all killed him. But God rose him from the dead, and he went back to heaven. The people felt very sad and guilty, so they asked Peter, what should we do? Peter answered, Turn away from your sins, and God will forgive you. Who wants to be the first one to receive the Holy Spirit? And 3,000 people were added to the believers that day. And they were all so happy and excited. Saul was a Pharisee, a religious leader, who knew God's law really well. He thought he was really cool, and that he was right, and that everyone who followed Jesus was wrong. He got permission from the chief priest to go to Damascus and round up followers of Jesus and throw them in jail. On his way to Damascus, a super bright beam of light came down from heaven and Saul became blind. He heard a loud voice that said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul was scared and said, ah, oh, don't kill me. Who are you? The voice responded, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Go up to the city and you will be told what to do. So he got some help from his companions to get to the city and didn't eat or drink for three days. God spoke to a very nice guy, a disciple named Ananias, and told him to go and heal Saul. Ananias said, hold on just a minute. That guy Saul, isn't he the one who is mean and killed my Christian friends? Are you sure about this? God said, yep, I'm always right. Saul will be the one who shares the good news about Jesus to those who aren't Jewish. He will help spread my message to the whole world. Ananias said, well, all right then. Off I go! Ananias went over to Saul and put his hands on Saul's face. And something like scales fell from his eyes and he could see. He was super happy and he ate food and strong again. And then he was baptized. Then Saul went around Damascus preaching to the Jews there all about Jesus. But the Jews didn't like his new ideas and wanted to kill him. So Saul's friends helped him escape the city by putting him in a basket and lowering him down a hole through the city wall. Saul went to Jerusalem to join the disciples, but they weren't too sure if they could trust him. So a friend of Saul's named Barnabas told them, Dudes, don't be afraid of Saul. He's cool. He's one of us now. So they welcomed him into the group. They all worked together to share God's message about Jesus. They went to lots of different places to speak about Jesus. They had some amazing adventures. They healed the blind and lame. Raised people from the dead. Saul changed his name to Paul. They even got arrested and thrown in jail, but an angel busted them out. Paul 
and brought him to the Roman governor Felix. Paul said, I haven't done anything wrong. I am a Roman citizen, and I appeal to Caesar. Felix replied, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. So Paul was brought onto a boat with a bunch of other prisoners to be sent to Rome to see Caesar. A Roman centurion named Julius was in charge. First they sailed to Myra, where they boarded a different ship that was carrying valuable grain to Rome. They set sail, but a huge hurricane hit, and they were thrown off course. They were tossed about in giant waves for days and were very scared. They tried to make the ship lighter by throwing stuff off of the ship. All the luggage and the steering things for the ship, and finally the valuable grain. <laughs> After 16 days in the storm, the ship hit a sandbar off the coast of an island called Malta. The front of the ship got stuck, and the back of the ship was smashed up. Everyone was like, we're all going to die. The soldiers decided to kill the prisoners, but Julia said no. Instead, they all jumped into the water. Some of them swam, and some of them hung onto floating bits of the ship, and they all made it to shore. Everyone, come by the fire and have a bite to eat. As Paul was helping build the fire, a venomous snake bit him. The islanders expected him to die, and that he got bit because he was probably a murderer. But when he didn't die and was perfectly fine, they decided, he's a god! They met Publius, the chief of the island, and stayed with him for three months. Paul taught them about Jesus and healed a bunch of people who were sick. Then they all got back on a new ship and sailed to Rome. Paul met Caesar, that is the Emperor Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, or Nero for short. He spent two years talking to people about Jesus and Christianity he started to spread around the world. We're in the dark still. <laughs> wow. Not yet? No sermon? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> the book of Acts describes the stories of people who were transformed by the Holy Spirit and how their adventures led to the formation of the early Christian church. These stories are filled with action and suspense and ended up changing the world. To really understand these events, we asked what the Holy Spirit even is and how it contributed, contributed to the transformation of the characters and their motivations. The book of Acts starts out with the story of Pentecost, when God sent the Holy Spirit to the disciples. But what even is the Holy Spirit? Most people know him as the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Spirit is something thought of as a comforter or a conscience, but also still God, which is hard to understand. 
In today's scripture verse from 2 Corinthians, it says, The Lord is the Spirit. Perhaps the Holy Spirit is like the part of the Trinity that connects people to God in tangible ways, resulting in effects that can be felt and seen, like a link between heaven and earth, between the spiritual and the physical, making God real in our lives. The Spirit gave the disciples supernatural powers. They spoke in other languages, healed the sick and lame, and even raised the dead. They expelled evil spirits, escaped jail, saw visions and angels, and survived shipwrecks and venomous snake bites. We know all of these things they did were impressive because they made a huge impact on the community around them. The religious leaders were very threatened by them, and the people either denounced them as heretics or were amazed by what they saw, and either joined the believers or considered them to be God's deserving worship. Either way, the responses were intense. God's influence channeled through the Holy Spirit could not be ignored. The Holy Spirit transformed the characters of many people in the book of Acts. The most obvious example was Paul, uh, formerly called Saul, who went from being the greatest persecutor of Christians to the greatest advocate. God redirected Paul's character traits. That he was always very intellectual, eloquent, and was committed to gener what he genuinely thought was right. But Paul was, uh, but Paul switched his motivation from strictly obeying Jewish law uh, and relying on his own self-righteousness to obeying Jesus and cr trusting him for guidance and strength. Jesus taught that what we feel and do matters more than what we know. It's kind of like how knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit but wisdom is not putting in a, in a fruit salad. Uh, uh, this is essentially saying that just knowing what the Bible says isn't enough. It's living it out that matters. And we need a relationship with Jesus to do that. Jesus gave him uh, the name Peter, which means uh, rock man. Wait, um, not like the rock star kind of rock man? The, the, the one... That, that, it's, I mean, um, someone who is stable, dependable, strong, and um, yeah, which foreshadows um, Peter's role in the early church uh, as a sturdy foundation. At Pentecost, he gave an eloquent speech to the Jews gathered there um, with boldness, confidence, and conviction. The other disciples were transformed too, but before Pentecost, they argued over, um, over who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They deserted Jesus and ran away when he was arrested. Um, they also doubted his resurrection and lived in constant fear um, of the religious authorities. But after ho the Holy Spirit came, they were joyful, courageous, and they shared with one another. They had changed their focus from seeking approval from others, from other people that is, to seeking approval from God. Even if that meant they would face ridicule, torture, and even imprisonment. Uh, they were able to face their difficulties because they kept Christ's last words with them. I am with you always, even until the end of the world. The Holy Spirit also drastically transformed the disciples' attitudes towards other people, especially towards the Gentiles, that is, those who were not Jewish. The Jewish people thought of God as being their own, and they weren't willing to share. When God informed them that his offer of salvation was for all people, the early Christians resisted the idea. Even Peter had trouble recognizing this, but he eventually accepted God's new inclusive approach when he admitted, who was I to think I could oppose God? This shows us that we should not exclude anyone for any reason. God's love is for everyone. The transformations didn't stop with just the Holy Spirit filling the disciples. Those who, that heard the message and believed were also changed for the better. This allowed God's message to spread like wildfire. Ultimately, the measure of a person's life is not in personal accomplishments. It is how we impact others and how we contribute to make the world a better place. The stories from the book of Acts describe how the insulated events of Christ's life, death and resurrection, 
started to impact people and change the world. All because the Holy Spirit transformed the lives of a few early believers. But the story that started in Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago is still going on all over the world. God's power through the Holy Spirit is real. And he sh can reshape our characters, motivate us to work for what matters, and be positive and influence, have an influence on other people's lives. And just like the early Christians, God doesn't promise us a life of ease, but he does promise to always be with us on the adventures he sends us on. That was a sermon that I'm not even going to try to talk. <laughs> thank you very much. A huge thank you goes out to uh, everybody who's involved in that. I want to. I want to thank uh, Kathy. I want to thank Kathy Marimbo, Carrie Kindred Barnes, Heather Price, and along with all the youth. We still have some things where there will be participation. The, the the youth are going to help us with the offering, and also David Robbins is going to bagpipe us out of the sanctuary. <laughs> so. A big thank you. I know a lot of people worked hard to make this happen. Let's quiet our hearts and go to God in prayer. Let us pray. God, our creator, we can picture you before all time and space began, singing a, singing a lonely song and from your music, beauty and harmony came to be. When our world was new, you sang a creative tune. And when we finally came along, you hummed merrily with joy and even danced a jig of excitement as you taught us to sing. When we were growing up, we thought we knew the music. We thought we could sing without you, but we sang out of key. And yet you still sang on in a stable at Bethlehem. You cried a humble tune which we did not hear. And then on an old wooden cross on a hill, your song was a lament weeping bitter tears as the noise drowned out the music. But it didn't end there. The music played on and three days later you danced a wild jig for the music could not die. And because of Pentecost, you poured out your spirit on all people that we would be your church, and still the music plays, and people young and old join the song with different voices and different tunes, and through Jesus, we all offer a sweet harmony of praise to you, O God. So precious God in Christ, accept our song, guide our voices, and meld us with your symphony so all the world can hear your music and all can join your song of faith, hope, and love. Through Jesus Christ, we offer this song to you, O God, for our world. Amen. I don't know about you guys, but I'm smiling. I'm so proud of these kids. Wow, thank you, thank you so much. It is because our children and youth are uh, offering their gifts to us this morning and the gifts that their teachers have brought to them, their time, their talent. So we're going to ask you to contribute with your treasure this morning. Um, 
It is because that you donate to the church, because you give your worship and your offerings to God, that we can have our children's ministry, that we can do uh, kids' ministry over the summer to the community, that we can have a vacation Bible camp, and that we can hire students to come and be part of all of that. And I am just so grateful that you um, are so generous with your finances and with your worship of our God and Savior. I invite the ushers to come forward uh, with the morning offering as Shifra plays our offertory. Thank you, Shifra. If you came prepared to give an offering this morning and you didn't get a chance, there will be a plate at the back and here at the front if you want to contribute on your way out. Please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for the gifts that we've seen on display this morning. We thank you that the children and the youth have shared, us, shared with us out of their generous spirit and out of their love for you. Father, I pray that you will take these gifts and our financial gifts, and Father, that you will use all of this towards your purpose and to further your work in this church and in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank you to everyone who participated this morning. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you sharing your gifts with us. Please give them a hand. Directly after the service, you're invited to go to Rotary Park to participate in our church picnic and barbecue. If you're not going to the park, well, even if you are, there's going to be coffee and some sweets out in the vestry. I invite you to go out there and partake. Introduce yourself to somebody you haven't met before and make a new friend today. Now go in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the Spirit be upon you this week, and may you recognize God appointments when you see them. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>